In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of the sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as, as he went, Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Uh, this passage of scripture uh, is often used at missions conference time, which we were coming into that season of our church's life. Um, but there's one aspect of this passage that has always kind of gripped my heart, and it's verse 6. Um, when I read verse 6, when I hear verse 6, um, it does a number of things for me. Uh, listen to it again. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, at first glance, it's a simple sentence. But when you think about it and you look a little more deeply, you hear a lot of emotion behind this little sentence. Right? What do you hear? Do you hear hope? I hear hope. Um, but I also hear more than that. I hear uh, exasperation, frustration, impatience. Lord, will you at this time, in other words, is it now time? It's kind of like when you take your kids on a trip. Are we there yet? You know, are we there? Is it now time to eat supper? My son would always ask me, you know, Jacob, you know, hey, when are we eating? When are we eating? When are we, I mean, I should have just had a recording. When are we eating, right? There's just an impatience there because there's a yearning, a desire for it so deeply. And these guys were yearning for the kingdom. And, and do you hear confusion? I definitely sense confusion in this question. I wonder if they ask it with just a little bit of hesitancy because of everything that they had seen and everything that they had been expecting. Uh, this, this verse actually gives me a lot of hope. I, I relate to it because many of the emotions and the feelings and the confusing ideas that circulate around the idea of the kingdom of God around last things, um, I think these apostles would relate to what we experience and what we are thinking and feeling and what we have seen even in our own age because there was so much of it in existence with them and with their generation and the generations before them. They had a strongly developed yearning to see the kingdom of God. And they had an expectation that Jesus was going to Bring the kingdom of God. Now, this morning, I need you to do something. I need you to figuratively, in fact, you may even want to do it. Just, I want you to take your right hand, okay? Take your right hand, hold it up, okay? And reach over your left shoulder. Ready? Now, just bring it across and click. You're strapping in, right? Okay? This is your captain. Fasten your seatbelts. There may be turbulence ahead, okay? We, we have got to dive deep this morning, and we have a lot to cover this morning. And I need you to hang with me, because what we're going to be covering this morning, it's important. We've got to understand, first of all, why these guys, why these apostles well, had such a strong yearning and expectation for the kingdom. And the reason why we have to understand their, essentially their worldview, their paradigm for the kingdom, if we don't understand their paradigm, 
then we don't understand, we will not understand the paradigm of the nation of Israel that was hearing, for example, the Sermon on the Mount. Because next week we're going to begin a series of messages on the Sermon on the Mount. And as these people, these Jews, are listening to the Sermon on the Mount, which is all about kingdom attitudes, they are bringing a paradigm, a worldview of the kingdom as they understood the kingdom to that sermon. Do you, do you track with me? Okay, and so, so they're hearing Jesus say kingdom and different things, and they're interpreting it through a grid, just as these apostles had been interpreting it through a grid because they are a product of their culture and their upbringing. And so right off the bat this morning, we have to understand who these men were and what that worldview was, what that grid was, so that as we move forward in the weeks ahead, we can put ourselves in the shoes and the seats, for example, of the original audience and take what Jesus is saying and kind of experience it the way they were experiencing it. And the confusing, confusion and the excitement and all of that you begin to catch when you understand the audience he was speaking to. So we've got to start there. We've got to understand why they felt the way they did about the kingdom, what they believed about the kingdom. And they believed certain things about the kingdom primarily because of two things. What they had been raised with, with the law and the prophets. What the law and the prophets basically taught them in the Old Testament was the foundation of their worldview of this filter. And then, secondly, there had been modifications over about a 400-year period between the close of the Old Testament and the New Testament that had definitely established a certain environment within the nation of Israel when it came to this idea of the kingdom. So let's start with the prophets and how their expectations were grounded in their understanding of the Old Testament. Um, we, one of our ministry partners, who we'll probably have here during the missions conference, is thirdmillennium.org. Wonderful ministry that is providing a biblical education to the world for free. And they, they produce history channel type uh, quality videos on the Bible and books of the Bible and subjects that are of interest in theology and doctrine. And, and I, I borrowed an image from them because they did such a great job showing how in the, the Jewish mindset, the worldview that, that was in existence was essentially, they would look at all of human history, both the past, their present, and the future, and they would divide it into three phases. The, the first phase is pretty obvious. It's creation. And we talked last week how humanity was created in a special way in the image of God, and we were tasked with serving as God's vice regents. We were the, we were the little kings underneath the great king. And we were given the commission to fill the earth with the image of God in order to show that all of the earth was God's kingdom. And however, our original parents were not satisfied with being vice regents, with, with being under kings, under the one king. And so they rebelled. And sin set the tone for this earth and our creation. And so the curse of the fall means that even in nature, we have things like we see hurricanes and natural disasters and diseases and environmental issues. All of our human life is affected as you read Genesis chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3, that because of the fall, relationships between spouses are now strained instead of being one flesh. Beautiful events in life like childbirth are now accompanied with pain and suffering and characterized by those things. Every system that humanity creates because of the fall is inherently flawed and broken and corrupted by sin. Every culture that arises within human history no matter how wonderful it may be, the seeds of its destruction are planted in its founding because of the fall. Every economic system that is developed, no matter how good, no matter how prosperous it may make a group of people, will still inevitably lead to poverty and exploitation of other people because of greed and lust for more and envy and sin. 
Name the system, name the human institution, the government, the political systems, the best political system in all of human history. And there is still injustice in that society and perpetrated by that system. Every culture, sooner or later, has its issues with racism and tribalism and all other kinds of isms. Why? Because every aspect of the human experience is affected by sin and the fall. Every system and institution. And at the deepest level of our souls, we are affected by the fall. In the garden, God announces the consequences of sin on humanity. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be death. The wages of sin, the Bible tells us in Romans, is what? Death. But in addition to announcing to humanity the consequences of sin, God uh, establishes some curses. He curses the ground. He curses Satan who tempted Adam and Eve. But it's very interesting that he doesn't curse is humanity. He may curse the ground and creation and Satan, but he doesn't curse that part of creation that has been created in his image. Instead, in the middle of this passage where he gives curses, he gives a promise. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God promises a redeemer. And this leads us to this passage, this phase of history that was so important to the law and the prophets. For in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we read, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Redemption was going to be promised and needed. This, This promise in... The book of Genesis is called the Proto-Euangelion, right? Proto is Greek for first. Euangelion is the word that we use for gospel or good news. In other words, it is the first good news of the Bible. And as you look at it, you realize there's a promise and a prophecy here that throughout history, there would be a strife, a war between the offspring of God and the offspring of Satan But ultimately, there would come one who will crush Satan. He reveals from the get-go his plan. And the Old Testament is the story of God unfolding this first gospel promise. In our Lord's Supper this morning, Jonathan made reference to the covenant with Adam and the, the covenant with Noah and Moses and Abraham and David. God unfolded this promise in the Old Testament through covenants, deep types of contracts with his people where there were promises of blessings and there was promises of consequences uh, depending upon their obedience. But in those covenants, Each covenant further unfolded the story and God's plan to restore creation and to demonstrate to his people his love for them, his saving grace, his desire to redeem for himself a people that were precious to him. The covenants reveal to us this unfathomable depth of God's love for his people. And one of the ways it does this, and one of the surprising ways that you see God's love for his people within the covenants is how much he puts up with God's people in the covenants. How much he, he, his mercy just goes on and on and on, even though they continually break the covenants. And they defy God, and they rebel against God, and in, in effect, they spit in God's face. And yet God does not turn his back on his people until finally they come to a point where they break the covenant. In Isaiah chapter 1, he says, you know, a donkey has more loyalty to his master than you do, Israel. You know, you are a rebellious, evil group of children. You're murderers and and all your worship makes me want to vomit. Your incense and your sacrifices, they are, they are pathetic. You, you city of Jerusalem, they're supposed to be a city on a shining hill. You're nothing more than a prostitute. They had degenerated so deeply 
that God, through the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel, he foretells and he explains that because they had broken the covenants to such an extent, they would be sent into exile. Part of the story of redemption is that there are consequences to sin. Humanity has to learn that there is a price to sin and defying God and rebelling against him. And so the Israelites are sent into exile. The northern kingdom is destroyed. The southern kingdom goes into exile. And here they are conquered and the temple is destroyed and the city is ravaged. And the people are now beginning to wail. And through those prophets that announce God's punishment and the fact that they now inherited the curses of their covenant, through those same prophets, he comes all back with more good news. He says, even though you have rebelled and you have sinned and you have broken all of the covenants, I will not turn my back on you. There is coming a day when I will restore you. I will not leave you in exile. I will not wipe you from the face of the earth. There is coming a day when I will make all things new and I will reside. My home will be your home. And that phase of human history is often referred to as the eschaton. Another Greek word that means the last phase or the last development or the last days, right? Eschatology is the study of last things. And so the, the, the Jewish mind of these apostles and these disciples, they, they clearly understood creation, that they had been living in what they called the present age, redemption, where, where God was working with his people through covenants. But their great hope was the, the eschaton, this final act where a new day would come. And last week in Malachi chapter 4, excuse me, Micah chapter 4, we read about that last day, right? Where the, where the swords will be beaten into plowshares and there would be war no more and the city of God would be established. Well, interestingly, Micah 4 was a quotation from Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, God is telling his people how badly they had defied him and how much they had offended him and how he was going to send them into exile. But then he says at the end of chapter 1, I'm not going to leave you there. And in chapter 2, that passage that we read in Micah 4 was actually a quotation from Isaiah 2. The same verses. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. All nations will stream to it and the law of God will be taught by our Lord and the swords will be beaten into plowshares and there'll be no war and there'll be peace, etc., etc., etc. So through the prophets that announced, here's the consequences. The covenant curses now come upon you. They give this beautiful story and promise of good news. The book of Isaiah is, here's the bad news, here's the good news. Here's the bad news, here's the good news. Here's the bad news, here's the good news. And when you come to the end of Isaiah, the good news is described like this. The eschaton, God says, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, who who was with the children of Israel in exile, who understood that through Jeremiah it was going to be for 70 years, he's given a vision of that day. I referred to it in the benediction last week. Daniel's given this vision, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forevermore. So clearly the prophets had been teaching that you could look at what God was doing and you could organize it and think about his interaction with humanity in this light, creation, redemption, a future eschaton. And the scriptures supported it. And these prophets, or excuse me, these apostles, they had been raised with this understanding of the prophets. But something had happened that made their understanding of what was happening in history take on a different tone. And that tone was because when the children of Israel returned from exile, 
The kingdom didn't happen. They came back from, from exile and they thought, okay, uh, we, we've done our time in exile. 70 years is now up. And so we come back, we rebuild the temple, we rebuild the city walls. Oh, okay, the kingdom of God is going to come. And the kingdom of God didn't come. In fact, the children of Israel continued to do the exact same thing that they had been doing all along. They had simply begun, excuse me, I'm falling apart here on my uh, technical at least it's not a, mal, uh, a wardrobe malfunction. They continued to do everything that they had been doing before, rebelling and defying God, and the, and the kingdom didn't come. What's going on? And, and then it even got worse because then you began to see world empires coming through. And Israel just became the, the stomping grounds of the Hittites and the, the Greeks and the Egyptians and finally the Romans. And each, each generation was more and more abused by world powers. This isn't the kingdom of God. What's going on? And so the spiritual leaders of that age, the rabbis, they began to go back to the prophets and they began to look and they're trying to understand what's happened. Why hasn't the kingdom come yet? And they began to develop a much more robust eschatology. And they began to teach the people what they needed to be looking for. They said, first of all, that this period of the eschaton, which happens after, sequential, right? One happens after another. That period of the eschaton, it's not going to happen until a great man comes on the scene. And this man would be in the line of David because God had promised to King David that his throne would rule forever. In 2 Samuel 7, your house, your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so the idea of the Messiah took on more and more development. They went back to Isaiah. They see these promises of one who would come and establish a government. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David. Again, this person would come from the line of David, this anointed one, which is the word in the Greek, Christ or Messiah. This anointed one would come from the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You can't get any more authorization than that last sentence, any more of a promise. I mean, God Almighty is going to give us someone who will establish this kingdom that will be characterized by righteousness, by justice, by peace. This Messiah is going to be like David, the warrior king. And what developed during this intertestamental period was that the Messiah was a warrior king, and his objective, first and foremost, was to reestablish the nation of Israel as a political entity that was the dominant nation and political entity in the world. The Jewish mindset, the Israeli mindset, became one of where the kingdom was simply a government, a, a political structure that was the strongest in the world. And they were not under the subjugation of heathen Gentiles like Greeks, or Romans. They expected their Messiah to come in and kick rear end. And they expected one massive climactic battle to end that second phase and to inaugurate the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God would not happen until this Messiah comes in and destroys all of the occupying armies and establishes Israel again as the dominant world power. That was the expectation that developed, especially from around 150 BC up to the time of Jesus during the Hasmonean dynasty. This was the teaching of the rabbis. This is what you read in the Midrashes and the other writings of the rabbis from that era. And what's interesting, and it kind of as a side note, not to dwell on it too much, but back in the 1940s, there was an archaeological discovery in Israel. In the, the Qumran caves, uh, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and it was insight into society, the Qumran society, which was a, a highly religious society in the time of Jesus. 
And in those documents, what's very interesting is they lay out what this was going to look like and what they expected the, the victory meal to look like and how everyone was going to be seated. And, and, what, and what scholars have begun to realize was at the time of the apostles, a popular idea that was being taught was that there were actually, in order for the eschaton to take place, there actually had to be two messiahs who would bring this about. One would be this strong warrior king Messiah. He's the dominant one. But they also needed a priestly Messiah. And it's interesting how the documents say his job would be, he would go in and he would cleanse the temple. He would uh, throw out those who were corrupting the worship of the temple. He would reestablish temple worship the way it's supposed to be and make it a place of prayer and sacrifice. Did those words sound familiar? What did Jesus do? Jesus went in and he cleansed the temple and he said, you've made my father's house into a place of business and he throws out the money changers and he turns the tables upside down. Jesus went all MMA on these guys, right? And he took them out. He was not some pansy-wasted, you know, guy who just went around humming show tunes all day. He had both this strength and this priestly, the kingly and the priestly in one. No wonder the apostles are confused. Because they're raised with this concept that this Messiah is going to come. May even need to be two Messiahs because in the book of Zechariah, you had Joshua, the strong leader of Israel at that time, and you had Zerubbabel, the strong priest. They reassembled. And so this had developed, but wow, in Jesus you have all of these roles in one person. We're seeing this. We're seeing on Mount Transfiguration, God himself saying, this is my anointed one. Jesus is saying, I am the Christ. I'm the anointed one. Jesus is sitting and raising people from the dead. He's doing miracles. He's even using language that they would have known. In Mark chapter 12, for example, he says, if you leave your father and mother and you're persecuted by others, you may lose your houses, your families, and everything that you have. But I promise you that if you follow me, you will have this and a hundred times more. And he uses an interesting expression. He says, you will have a hundred times more in this present age and in the what? Age to come. You see, this was the rabbinical language of that day who described this phase of redemption and sin and the fallen. This was the present age. You see the Apostle Paul using the same language. Again, he was trained to be a rabbi. And he says and throughout the, the, the epistles how we are in this present evil age but we have the age to come. So, so Jesus is using the language they were familiar with. Jesus is not meeting all the criteria that they were expecting, except, man, he's doing it all by himself. There doesn't, there's no need for a priestly Messiah. Jesus is cleansing the temple. Jesus is doing what we expected. Jesus has all this power. Jesus has God and the angels at his disposal because he's God in the flesh. He is the ultimate warrior king. No wonder their expectations are so high, and then Jesus dies. What? That was not in the teachings at all. And Jesus actually turns their whole idea of kingdom upside down. He reframes the concepts of the kingdom even while using language that sounded familiar, even while affirming certain aspects of what they had been taught and what they were led to believe, even while, you know, maybe agreeing with aspects of how they would look at the kingdom, he says, guys, your filter is wrong. You need a new filter. And so in his ministry, Jesus, he, he affirms that there's going to be a kingdom but he completely reframes it and redefines it and turns their understanding of it upside down. And, and guys, you've got to understand this because as we go through the Sermon on the Mount and you hear Jesus saying what he says to them and you see their reactions, you go, why are they reacting this way? Because he's coming from left field in a lot of ways. For example, I want to, I'm going to show you five ways as we close out 
this morning. Five ways that he just completely reframes it. The, the first one is maybe the most important, and that is as to timing. Now remember, their idea of timing was that they're sequential. But Jesus, he turns that upside down. He says the kingdom isn't sequential to the present age. In other words, it isn't that the present age ends and then the age to come now begins. No, they're not sequential. There's not one right after the other. They actually overlap. The eschaton and redemption overlap. The age to come and the present age overlap. In Luke chapter 17, verse 20, one day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already, what's the next two words? Say it out loud. Among you. Yes. The kingdom's already here. Yet, as we're going to see when we get to the Lord's Prayer, and we study the Lord's Prayer this year, what is he pray in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. See, in Jesus's ministry, he presented what we refer to as the kingdom being now. It's already here, but it's not yet fulfilled and completely here. Um, J.I. Packer describes it like this. He says, the kingdom is present in its beginning, though future in its fullness. In one sense, it is here already, but in the richest sense, it is still to come. If there's one principle, folks, that I want you to walk out of this room with this morning, is this one. That the kingdom is now and not yet. Say that with me. Ready? Now and not yet. One more time. Now and not yet. Okay. This tension, when we talk about the kingdom growing in us, we have to understand this tension. It's in the epistles where Paul, on the one hand, tells us that all power and every spiritual blessing, we have all we need to live the victorious Christian life, and yet in another passage we'll say, this body of sin what am I going to do with this body of sin? You see, on the one hand, we have complete victory over sin, and we've been sanctified in God's sight, yet we still struggle with sin. We read that death has been defeated, but some of you are grieving this morning. Why? Say it with me. Now and not yet. This is why. And so the the phases aren't sequential, they, they overlap. We gotta, we gotta see this. Second one was as to the nature of the kingdom. The kingdom is first spiritual, which then affects the physical world. It wasn't about establishing a political dynasty. It's first and all spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. We need to remember that. That's why we're asking you to pray. Pray for the elders. Pray for the visioning committee that is doing work that we talked about at the Come Together event. Because our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and darkness. Colossians 1, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That proto-evangelion, that first gospel said, listen, it's going to be us against you, bubs. Kingdom of darkness, that's in the Hebrew. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. And what is God doing? All through history, he has been taking people out of the kingdom of darkness and building the kingdom of light. And the future story is that the kingdom of light completely overcomes the kingdom of darkness. That's its nature. Thirdly, how does it grow? We understand more about the timing and the nature, but how does it grow? Well, the kingdom isn't established instantaneously in one moment in time, but it gradually consumes this reality that we live in. 
Jesus gave an illustration, a parable in the book of Matthew. Those of you who bake and maybe you've worked with yeast, you, you can appreciate this. He says, I told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. It's like yeast that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour. Now, you know what's going to happen, right? Those of you who cook, if you take a little bit of leaven or yeast and you, and you put it, you can just take a little bit and you can put it in a whole container. But if you leave it there long enough, what happens? The whole container is leavened. And Jesus said, you know what? I've came here. I've gotten my 12 disciples and some other 120 at the opening book of Acts. There's the whole Roman Empire. There's the whole of Western civilization. I've got a little bit of leaven. But guess what? You give it time and the whole batch will become leavened and will grow. And that's how he's growing the kingdom. And he's doing that through us. Fourthly, how about the purpose? The kingdom isn't about restoration of a nation state, but the restoration of this world and the reconciliation of God's people. Do you know why I have affinity for certain environmental groups? Not the wacko environmental groups, I'm sorry if that offends somebody. But I believe in taking care of our earth. I believe in taking care of our lagoon. I believe we need to do something about it in our own backyard, about the pollution and the environment. Why? Because God's ultimate plan is to see a purified, restored earth. We need to get a jump on things. Because a good earth is in the plan of God. I, I wish that we as Christians were leading this movement in our world to steward our resources and our earth to oppose those who exploit for more money. But our IRAs, we, we don't like what it does to our retirement funds by doing that, and so we shut up a lot of times. But God is interested in the restoration of all creation. Recognize that. That's his ultimate plan. He is going to make this broken world completely whole. That's what we're going to live in one day. We're going to live on an earth one day that has no pollution, that has no disease and catastrophes. And we don't, folks, we don't live in a place sitting on a cloud wearing something that looks like a diaper playing a harp for all of eternity. That's not our destiny. Frankly, if that was what God had promised, I might, that doesn't sound too good. Our destiny, folks, is to walk with God in the garden in the cool of the evening like it was in Genesis chapter 2. Here on earth, he's going to recreate the new heavens and the new earth. He's going to recreate our bodies, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. That's our destiny. He's all about restoring this world and reconciling a people to himself. The Bible says we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we, believe all, we believers also groan, even though we had the Holy Spirit within us as we foretaste, have a, as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies. He has promised us. Let's talk about how he does it, the means. The kingdom doesn't grow through military might. It grows through us communicating the gospel. What does he say back in our text? We read this text and we talk about the Holy Spirit. He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we read this and our focus on the Holy Spirit tends to be very much, Lord, help me not to sin. I need power in my battles against sin. But why was the Holy Spirit first and foremost given according to Acts chapter 1 verse 8? And you will be my, say it, witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Does the Holy Spirit help us with our battles against sin? Absolutely. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower us to be witnesses for our Lord Jesus Christ and to grow the kingdom of God. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is for us 
to engage in the battle and in the war that is taking place around us because this battle is not physical, it is spiritual. And we need the Spirit of God as we engage. Back in the 1960s, a man by the name of Oscar Coleman wrote a book called Christ in Time. And he used concepts from World War II to help us understand what is happening and what God is doing in this now and not yet and how the Lord has established this. Uh, most of us have seen this picture, right? How many of you have seen the picture? Raise your hand, right? This is the picture at the end of the war, right? The Japanese have surrendered. It's VJ Day, right? And... Uh, this great picture of this sailor kissing this gal. I wonder if he knew her. I wonder if she's shocked. I actually ran across a picture, and I kid you not, this is totally off topic, but this goes to show you the world that we're in nowadays. I ran across this picture, and I clicked on it, and it took me to a blog where the blogger was uh, asserting that he was sexually assaulting her, and he, he was reading body language. What a great picture. They're celebrating the end of the war. But you know what? Every general knows. On both sides of the, the war, that this day would never occur, and this picture would never occur without this picture. What's this picture? Anybody know? Normandy, that's right. D-Day. You see, in a course of... World War II, we focused on Germany and the Nazis and the evil empire first. That was our main focus. And generals on both sides knew that the only way we would ever defeat the Nazis was to establish a beachhead in Europe and then take back the territory that the Nazis had conquered. And so on June 7th, 1944, our troops storm ashore in D-Day. What a horrific battle. But that battle, generals on both sides would always point and say, that's the turning point of the war. That's when the war was won for the Allies. But now listen, did they go instantaneously from that picture to this picture? No, right? I mean, there's, there's months, there's like over a year between the first picture and this picture. Why? Because the forces had to, to beat back the Nazis all the way to Germany, and then the Pacific forces had to remove the Japanese, and, and there was a lot of war and battles, and there was victories and defeats, and there were casualties that took place. But listen, the war, it was won. Everybody knew it. It was just going to be a matter of time before this. Now, not yet, folks. We are those forces that are pushing and reclaiming land. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in his death and his resurrection, that was D-Day. He established the beachhead. He established the kingdom. It's here now, and the celebration is coming right now. You and I, through us, we push back the forces of evil until that glorious day. Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in that battle and in this war and in this grand work that you are doing to restore your creation and bring a people to yourself. Make Covenant Church a church that is on the front lines of that war. Lord, let us not be a group of people who sit on the sidelines and watch other people fight. But may we be filled with your spirit. May we engage the enemy where we find him in all of his many guises. And may we be victorious through our Lord Jesus Christ for his glory. So that one day we will celebrate with him as his kingdom comes in all of its fullness. In his name we pray. Amen.